person is, this handsome, very young man? The creator of JavaScript, right? Does anyone know his name? Okay, no, Eric something, very good. Eric Netsky. <laughs> very good. It's Brandon Ike, right? You don't have to really remember this, it's not super important. You're pretty close, it started with E somewhere. Um, but the idea here is that he wrote JavaScript in about 10 days. Yeah, so the time it took you to do your mod one project plus the weekend, he wrote the language of JavaScript. Powerful, all right? Uh, I tell you that not because uh, it's a super fun fact, but also because that's why JavaScript is so weird. Like, imagine going back to your project and having to work on your project and having hundreds of thousands of people work on your mod one project for years to come. There's gonna be a couple weird bugs in it here and there. And so uh, we're gonna talk about like JavaScript and how it is a little bit funky in the way that it runs and executes your code. And sometimes you can't always assume what things are. Uh, but what I wanna talk about is, and we're gonna have to blow his face up a little bit, just a little bit, all right, is that what JavaScript is, it's a, uh, and you'll hear a lot of these terms. If you want me to dive into them, please ask. I'm gonna try my best to explain them. It's a multi-paradigm programming language. So what that means is when you've learned in Ruby, you've learned something called object-oriented programming. Does anyone have like an idea or like who want to give a definition of what their thoughts on object-oriented programming is? So good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, so to summarize that answer, it's object-oriented programming has to do with shared state. And so when you created this class of dog, right, every time you made a new dog, all these instances shared the same attributes, right? They have like this classical form of inheritance, right? Dog inherits from animal, so that your dog can now have all the properties and methods that were on animal. JavaScript, all right, was originally produced as like this functional programming language where it wasn't focused on the shared state, but something called immutability. And that means that once I instantiate something, it'll never change, that's what's gonna be always and forever. And so that's kind of like just the high level overview of what the differences are. Now, when I say multi-paradigm, I mean that JavaScript can be both object-oriented and functional programming. And so you'll have like this interesting combination of both, and you'll have to learn when to separate each. It'll make a lot more sense later. I just want to kind of give you this like broad overview. So what happened is back in the day, uh, do you guys remember this? Netscape Navigator? Some of you are, some of you are very, very young. Um, uh, but for those that uh, <laughs> recognize this fossil over here, look at this, 1994 to 1996. Back in the day when surfing the web was like really cool. I, I don't know what that means, surf the web. But either way, the point is, um, you ever seen this symbol that says like best viewed in Netscape Navigator? Best viewed in Internet Explorer? Let's just take a look. Cool. Best viewed in Netscape. Cool. Let's take a look. Do, do, do. You ever seen something like this? This site is best viewed with Netscape Navigator. Download Netscape now. Does this seem familiar at all? Okay, so for those that, um, you know, this makes sense to, I'm gonna go into something called the, what the browser wars were. And that is, should I go with this Internet Explorer? Should I use like the, the Net Zero browser, Dolphin, Opera, Chrome, Internet Explorer, and all these different browsers, which one should I use? And so they would always compete for your business and the weird thing is that if I went on one website, some of the functionality would work. And I will go on the exact same website with a different browser, it would have different functionality. Sometimes if I go on like Mozilla and I click this thing, it works perfect. But when I use Chrome or Internet Explorer or Edge, it, it doesn't work. And so the idea here is that your JavaScript runs and is executed by the browser. 
So the browser is like the runtime for JavaScript. That's what actually, actually executes your JavaScript code. And so if that's the case, then that means each individual browser would run your JavaScript slightly differently. And so back in the day, it would be like, hey, use my browser because I do JavaScript correctly. And it, everything works if you use Netscape on my website. The problem is, this is a terrible user experience, right? Like, pff, one star. And so if that's the case, then at some point, the lords that may be formed an organization called the European Computer Manufacturers Association. Here's for, henceforth known as ECMA, E-C-M-A. What they did was, in about uh, 2015, they formed what is known as ES6 or ES2015 or Harmony JavaScript, whatever you want to call it. But that is essentially what is known as the modern JavaScript. They had standardized JavaScript across all the different browsers. And the only really way to do that is if I write it one way, I have to appropriately write it in the way that makes sense for your browser. So that is known as like polyfill. If I write, um, like in Ruby, right, if I were to just come up here and just rock this over here, def, and then like method, boop, boop, boop. And however I decide to write this method, it needs to work in all the browsers. And so it literally will backwards write certain things. And so that's like the polyfill. If, it, if I write it one way, it should work backwards compatible with everything else previously. Cool. And so that's kind of what the browser wars were. And then everything synced up. Are there any questions on like the browser wars, what that is? It feels comfortable with the browser wars. Cool. That's just like a general overall topic. And the idea is that you as web developers should know some of the history and understand some of like the future impacts that things like this have had. And so what JavaScript was, was this ability to run behavior in the browser, right? You have HTML, which is essentially like the skeleton. Then you have CSS, which is all the styling. And now, if I click a button and I want a modal to pop up, or I want to scroll, I want to create this cool functionality, right? You ever seen like Twitter? You ever seen Coffee Dad? Right? For whatever reason, like Flatiron School loves this guy. Um, it's a bot. Uh, it's usually like pretty cool stuff, like fresh cup of coffee, getting coffee. I really want coffee, and then sometimes it gets really dark, right? Like out of nowhere, I'll see some tweets that are like, yo, I really miss my son. Like that car accident really traumatized me, and you're like, oh my god. Um, yeah, like sometimes it just gets weird. Um, so, uh, subtle sidetrack here. The idea is that, like if you look at this here, where my scroll is, if I get to the bottom, what happens? Right? Does it just hit the end and stop? No, right? For whatever reason, this feature, this functionality is called the infinite scroll. All right, I can, in theory, as long as this person has more tweets, I can just scroll and get more forever and ever and ever, right? OK. So what's actually happening here? Close, close. Yes, that's exactly what it's doing, right? But let me explain that so for like everyone else. Um, what's happening here is, let's just break this down as we already know and understand how the web works. So quick review, bloop, bloop, bloop. You have the request response cycle, right? You remember this from mod two? Eat. So something happens, right? Some sort of click, maybe a scroll, right? We'll fire off a request. So if I click submit this form, right? You have your form four and you hit submit. What does it do? That's right, it sends a request, right? It's some sort of post to slash animals, right? Maybe it's a link to, and it's like a get to slash Ian is awesome, whatever the website may be. And then it hits the server, right? So this is like your Rails, your backend, your controller. It checks to see, does that route exist? Boom. And then it goes, wait, what controller action do you want? Cool, controller called people with an action called awesome. And then it looks for data, right? You need some sort of like, at people equals people.all, it touches the database, mega bless. 
and then it comes back to the controller, right? The model interacts with the controller, and then it sends back what? It's response. So what you'll like learn from me is like I will like very often just feed you the answer. It's so much easier if you just yell out the answer. Um, it's weird like talking to myself. Um, I'm sure you would imagine. Blogs are kind of weird, right? Just help me out here. So it sends back this response, right? And then that response is usually some sort of HTML, and it goes back to the computer, like the browser, that session, that client, and that whole thing repeats over and over and over, the request response cycle. What if, right, instead of like clicking and submitting a form, I scrolled all the way to the bottom of a page? Now, I know that it scrolls to the bottom of the page. That can send off a request by simply scrolling to the bottom of the page. And then that can hit the Rails backend and be like, great, listen, right now I have 20 tweets, but I know you're hiding the good stuff. You've got at least 40 to 59, which is like the next 20 tweets. And then that's hitting the data. It comes back over as a response, just 20 tweets. And then what do I do? I just like add it to the, the website. That's all I really do. That's what's happening here. But it's with the power of JavaScript. So it doesn't actually refresh the whole page. Because if we really take a look and we dive into it, if I wanted to, right, take a look. Have you seen the DevTools? All right. What you could do is you could take a look at network. If I hit refresh, this will tell me every single thing that happens inside this request response cycle. So what did I do? I simply refreshed the page, so I made a brand new get request to twitter.com slash coffee dad. And then inside, you could take a look. This is everything that I had to download, right? All the files that I had to download. I should hit all, embarrassing. These are all the files that I had to download. Where do these files come from? Well, if we look at elements, and it's okay. Wow. Inside the head or even the body, look at this. There's this script tag, this no script tag. If I open inside the head, I see script tags, I see these links. What this is telling the browser is I've got a lot of data everywhere. There's a link here that should be the, maybe this picture of like this dude. Go to that other website, download the picture, and then show it on the page. And so when I see network, somewhere here, one of the link twos, one of the link tags, told it to go download that photo somewhere. And so I could see all of the files that I downloaded right here. Now, if I take a look, every time I refresh, it has to download all of those files over. Notice how the whole thing refreshed. Now, if I go all the way to the bottom, notice what it's doing. It's just making these additional baby requests for more features. I don't actually refresh the whole page. I don't need to re-download this image. I don't re need to re-download this nav bar, this follow button, maybe this sign up button. I don't really need to download all of that over because we live in such a futuristic age that look how much extra stuff it would take, right? There's like 500 bytes here, 1.1 kilobytes here, 2.9 kilobytes here, 68 kilobytes. If I keep downloading all of this, Think about what happens on your phone, right? Who here has like unlimited data on your phone? It's okay, you're rich, you can admit it, it's all right. I come from an age where I had to download like two gigabytes at a time every month, and then they would charge me. Oh my God, what a, what a time to be alive, unlimited data. So the idea here is you wanna keep the amount of data that you have to send over the internet as low as possible to create the best user experience. Because if I wanted more tweets, then I'd have to reload the whole thing. I don't want to do that. What a terrible user experience. It'll be slow. And so the idea here is that all I'm trying to do is fire off this like network request slowly, silently in the background to get more information. And then I'm just going to add it to the website without having to re-download everything. Cool? And that's kind of what the scope of all of Mod3 is going to be. How do we do that? Cool? All right. Cool, 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 cool. All right. So. Let's talk about a lot of the things that you kind of went over um, over the weekend, but I'm going to try to solidify a lot of it now, and so we'll make a lot of comparisons to Ruby. 
And so we'll see how that translates over, all right? So here are the different data types in JavaScript. What did you know as data types in Ruby? Just, you can just shout them out, all right? All right, very good, array, we can start with that. Integer, right? Hash, booleans, cool. So JavaScript is very similar, yes? They are objects, but they're also sort of like data types, for more or less, like what our purposes are here. Um, but the idea here is that JavaScript has seven. All right, and it gets a little dicey here. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is kind of what all of these are, kind of how they relate to Ruby. The symbol, right? Have you seen, you've seen this before, where you're trying to go into your params, and instead of the string, right, uh, animals or whatever, what did you guys use? This, this colon action, right? So this is saying that there is a symbol animals in here. Cool? It's a different type of data type. Uh, it has like a faster lookup in terms of like the string versus symbol. That's not really important. That's more computer science-y stuff. The idea here is that JavaScript has symbols as well. Symbols work very differently in JavaScript, and we will not be working with them in the course of this Mod 3. If you want to learn more about them, I'd be happy to talk with you offline. If you want to do a blog post on it, it's like very interesting stuff. All right, we have undefined here. So undefined is very interesting. Does anyone want to take a stab at what undefined is? Yes, if you have declared a variable, but you have not assigned it a value, it is undefined. Allow me to try attempting to demonstrate. So here we are, uh, we have the console here. Let me just blow this up for you, bloop, bloop, bloop. Let's clear that out. All right, so if I were to say, uh, your boy, right? And I would just simply hit enter. What do you think will come back if I reference some variable called your boy? All right. So there's an uncaught reference error. Your boy is not defined, which is very interesting. Because I've never actually defined it anywhere. I never said var, let, const, your boy equals to whatever. I've never assigned it a value. I've never even actually made a reference to it ever. I just said, hey, give me your boy. Give me that variable. So Chrome's going to be like, look, you never even mentioned this thing. It's, that's kind of weird. It doesn't exist. However, if I said var, your boy, and I did nothing else. I want just put a semicolon here, like a dirtbag. Or automatic semicolon insertion. I can just do this. And so if I look at your boy, what do I get? I get undefined. And that's simply saying that I'm declaring this variable, but I'm not giving it any value. It has no real value. So JavaScript and Chrome, the engine, will have to be like, all right, look, you made this variable but you never gave it any sort of value, so I'm just gonna default stick this thing in called undefined, versus throwing some sort of error when it wasn't even referenced or declared ever. And this is important because as you're going through and you're writing a bunch of code, the idea here is that you'll declare a lot of variables, but you won't assign them to anything, and so you want JavaScript to tell you like, hey, listen, that variable exists, but it has no real value. And I, as the computer, gave it an undefined, which is important because it takes us to our next point. We have something called null. What do you think null is? Null doesn't mean it doesn't exist as much as it specifically has no value. So this is important because as I'm programming and I'm writing my code, all right, your boy is undefined. The computer recognizes that there is a reference to this variable that has no value. But if I were to say something like your boy equals to null, right, which has no real value, if somebody's looking through my code, right, they put a buy bug or something in there, and they're jumping through the code, and they see null, can they determine whether or not that was there on purpose, or if the computer assigned that value of nothing? They can tell that it was done on purpose. So sometimes if you have default attributes, you want them to be nothing. You want them to be empty at first. 
And so if that's the case, I see null, I know that it was done on purpose. But if I see undefined, I might dig into that and be like, wait, why is this undefined? And so that's kind of one of those like important pieces there. Are there any questions between uh, the difference between null and undefined and how that might be useful? It was pretty good about it. Yeah? The computer ever null? Never. The computer will always just be like, yo, that's undefined. So it's V useful. It's powerful. All right. Let's keep going. All right, cool. Boolean is Boolean, yeah? Just you got your true and your false. Any questions on that? Noise. I was hoping not. That was just questions on that. I get kind of dicey. All right. So we have something called number here. Let's talk a little bit about number. Um, let's just do this. We have number and string, and we have something called object. I'm going to get into object, but let's talk about like number and string. There's something called primitives in JavaScript, which doesn't necessarily exist in Ruby. Um, primitives are passed by value, and this should make sense, right? Pass by value, you don't really know what that means, but I'll explain here in a little bit. Okay, let's do that. Let's do that. Cool. I have a variable, right, called eight. Oops. Wow, that was weird. And I'm just gonna assign it the value of eight. Cool. If I were to do, what is eight plus plus? You know what this is? This is just an incrementer, right? If I hit enter, what do I get? Interesting. And then I ask for eight again, what do I get? This class is so powerful. Cool. If I do this, what happens? I get nine immediately, right? Good deal. Cool. So if I take a look at eight, I see eight. Let's refresh. Let's do this again. I have var eight is equal to eight. Cool. And then I have eight again. Oof, let me do this. Equals to the variable eight. No big deal. So what is eight again? It's just the number eight. If I do eight plus plus. So what is the value of eight again, and what is the value of the variable eight? Eight is value is nine, and eight again is value is at eight. Which makes total sense. Right? Anyone confused on this? All right, cool. It gets dicey later. But this is what it means by when something is passed by value. That means that whatever value, variable has the value, it retains its own value. That should make sense, and you're probably wondering why I'm going into that. Don't worry. It's going to be all right. So in Ruby, you had like string interpolation. You had to use the double quotes. It didn't work with the single quotes. And you had to use this like pound sign and just put like interpolated, right? That's how you interpolate it. In JavaScript, it's a little different. You can use single or double quotes. It is actually like completely irrelevant. In order to interpolate something, you have to use these backticks. If you are wondering where that is, it's like the key above tab on the US standard keyboard. And then instead of the dot, instead of the pound sign, you have this like sweet money sign. Cool. Should be no no questions on this. Like very straightforward. No. I, all right. Cool. In Ruby, if I were to ask the class of a number, what would I get? If I were to ask for the dot class of a number, right? If I were to do this, bloop, 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 bloop. let me come on spectacle. Let me do that. And I go to IRB. And I were to go eight, eight's great, right? Like I'm Asian, it's supposed to be a lucky number. I don't believe in it, but you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. All right, so if I were to do dot, dot, dot class, what do I get? That's right, fixed them. Absolutely, very good. So <laughs> I tricked you, right? Now, um, man says stores. You guys remember this from like the mod one uh, inheritance lecture? Yes. Well, Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Please do. Yes. Uh, cool. So it's like fixed num and then integer, numeric, comparable, object, kernel, and then basic object. This is all that order of inheritance. All right. So if I do 8.0, what is this? 
It's a float, right? Ruby likes to overcomplicate things. JavaScript doesn't play that game, all right? Everything is just a number. It's either a number or it's not, which is ironic because there's something called not a number, but we'll talk about that in a second. So you have like negative one, number, right? Negative one exponential, like to the power of two, right? Any exponents, that's a number. And your floats, your 1.1s, your 4.7s, your 8.8s, number, all right? What happens when I try to multiply like a string by three in Ruby? In Ruby, all right? Eat times two. It's just to go, it says, hey, why don't you just repeat that twice, all right? In JavaScript, however, if I were to try to play that game and I were to say eat is for cheats times 10, I get something called NAN, which stands for not a number, which is very interesting. There's something in Ruby that you can use to like check to see what kind of class it is, like what type of object this thing is, is you just put dot class. In JavaScript, it's type of, right? So if I would put type of, all lowercase for some reason, and I were to put nine, I should get, this is like a number. This is like a type of number. In the same way that if I put a string, and I were to put yeets for cheats, I get this string class. Cool? What happens if I put, what is the type of not a number? That's right. So not a number is actually a type of number, which is um, supposed to be hilarious. So you guys are really serious about learning, which is great. Um, so it just falls under the number class, right? So if I were to be like, hey, what is like 17 times the word four divided by like a variable table, which happens to just be an array? You'd be like, that doesn't make any sense. And JavaScript would be like, exactly. What you're asking for is not a number. Cool? And so it doesn't even bother trying. It just goes, look, whatever you're trying to do, that's not a number. And it just return NAN. Cool? If you're like really looking for what the practicality of this is, if you're like waiting for the subway and tell like, hey, like the four train to like East Chester Dyer Park is three minutes away. Yeah, that's like calculated through like the magic of like computers. If you ever look really closely, right before it refreshes or loads, sometimes when it errors out, it'll say it's NAN away. Because like apparently it's done in JavaScript. Powerful. You've seen that? Yeah, it's 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 real. Um, so now you know. Welcome to the matrix. Cool. Let's talk about this parse int real quick for a little bit. Um, if I were to do parse int, which just converts the string into a number, I get one, two, three. Right? The number one, two, three. If I try parsing the integer of one, two, three dot four, five, six, I get one, two, three. If I do parse float, it'll actually give me the correct return value. If I were to do parse in one, two, three, it'll be like, yo, uh, I don't know what that is. Nice try. It'll say not a number. Cool? So here's the weird thing. Um, let's do this. If I were to try parse int a number like one, two, oh, hey, hey, embarrassing, thank you, all right, I get one, two, three, no big deal. If I were to do like straight up ABBA, right, one, two, three, ABC. So what you can infer from both this example and this example is that when it comes to parsing the integer, the second JavaScript comes up with something that is not a number, it'll just stop. It'll try its best and then hit this dot and be like, yo, dog, I don't know what you're talking about, and just stop running. But it will actually convert the first half. So in that exact same way, A, B, C, 4, 5, 6 is still just 1, 2, 3. If I were to do parse in A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, what will I get? That's right, because the first thing it comes across is A, it's like, I don't know what that is, dog, and then it'll just break out and be like, sorry, no thanks, not a number. Cool? Noise. All right, cool. So in Ruby, 
what were the falsy values in Ruby? That's right, nil and false. I won't ask you to memorize much. I really won't. But there's a few things that unfortunately you just have to memorize. And that is false is false. Thank God. Zero is false. Empty string is false. Just like nil was, null is also false. Undefined is false and not a number is false. So you have more falsy values in JavaScript. Cool? Are there any questions? Like, it should be somewhat straightforward, but there's just little differences between Ruby and JavaScript. Cool? I'm going to push all this code. So for those that are writing it down, I think it's a very good learning technique and tactic in terms of having like that tactile feel, that neurokinetic connection between writing it and memorizing it. Um, but I will be pushing all of the code and like the lecture videos just so you guys have reference to it. Cool? Say again? Perfect. Do your thing. Um, cool, cool, cool. All right. All right, something called non primitives. This is what is known as pass by reference. This is the weirdest thing in JavaScript. One of the weird things in JavaScript. So objects are passed by reference. Objects are passed by reference. Cool? Objects are passed by reference. This is very important. Versus primitives. So primitives is anything but an object, right? So you've got your undefines, your nulls, your booleans, your numbers, your strings. Those are all primitives. Your non-primitives are your objects. So let's take a look. Ready? Let's clear this out. I can have a var, right? I can have an object that's just called teachers. Boop, boop, boop. And we can have uh, Dana. Boop. Dana, you got a cool nickname for us, or? Uh, very good. Oh, D. Ah. Is for Dana, right? OK. And then uh, we have E in here. Cool. Are they ready? Yo, yeasty boy. I'll explain. All right. He bakes all his own bread. Uh, so he's, he's quite powerful. All right. Don't worry. We won't forget about Gabby over here. Cool. So we have this like teachers, right? Object. So you can think of like your hashes in Ruby as almost this literal equivalent to object in JavaScript. It's just key value pairs. Python and Java, they're called dictionary but you have some sort of key pointing to a value. That's it, right? So if I say object, I'm referring to what you currently know is like a hash. So for the teachers, right, if I wanted to add an, another key to this, actually, let me do this. Uh, let's put teachers2 is equal to teachers. So far, so good, right? So if I put teachers2, what is it? Dana and Ian? That's it, no big deal. I'm just creating like this sort of like shallow copy. So if I would put teachers2 dot Gabby, right? I'm adding another key value to this. Gabby, you got something fly for us? No? OK. All right. And Gabtron? You know what? Good answer. Apparently, she approved. So we have Gabtron, right? So if I were to look at teachers2, I see Dana, Ian, and Gabby, which makes total sense, right? What is the value of teachers? Why would this be happening for those that like obviously did the readings? Powerful. That's correct, right? So teachers two was assigned the same value as teachers, which is somehow different than when I did var 8 and then I did like 8 again because objects are passed by reference. What I'm trying to say is that when I created the object teachers, what I did was in memory somewhere, this is like what memory looks like on a computer, right? Sure, this is what memory looks like. When I did the teachers and I put the, the curly boys, right, and I made this object. I put somewhere in memory, like, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, someplace in memory. And then when I did teachers2 is equal to teachers, what I simply said was, teachers is going to point to 0, 0, 1 in memory. 
Teachers, too, will also point to the same place in memory, 001. So if I reference teachers or teachers, too, they both reference this one block in memory. There's a reference to it. So if I mutate or change or adjust teachers, too, that means that 001 in memory is changed. So when I say, hey, what is teachers? It's going to refer to the same place in memory, which is now that mutated object. The question is, is there a way to make... Like the, everything that's passed by value is by default. Is there a way to make the path by reference? There is no real way to make things that are not passed by reference, pass by reference, uh, and, and the, the exact opposite. However, you will need to get around this. Um, and this comes back to the point of JavaScript being immutable. You want to have these two separate objects. If I ever actually wanted to make a separate copy of teachers, right, that does not affect the original teachers, I'll have to make a what is known as a deep copy. And there's ways to do that. And that follows this immutability principle, where one object and another object, uh, even though they currently identically have the same values, they're not pointing to the same place in memory. There's ways to do that. We'll get into that later. Cool. Are there any questions on this, like, pass by reference? Who feels comfortable about this pass by reference? Okay, so there's a shallow copy, right, which is what I just did, and then there's something called a deep copy. Yeah. So if I were to do, like, something like teachers, whoop, teachers and teachers too, it should be true. Right? They, they're the same. Say again? If I do three equals, will it be true still? Oh, okay. What the difference between the two are? Or? Mm -hmm. So, does anyone know what the difference between this double and this triple equal are? Right, this like strict equality versus loose equality. And one of the main differences is like one, whoop, double equal one is true, right? Because it's like loosely equal, and triple equal, they are not, right? String one and integer one, number one are different. Cool? Uh, before I get to yours, you had a question. Correct. So if you were to slice something, um, if you read the documentation, just like if you were to map over something in Ruby, what does map return? A new array. Correct. So that's why reading the documentation is super good. Very good question. Actually, all the questions are good. I don't want you guys to feel like, oh man, my question wasn't really good. You know? <laughs> Sir. Say again? It's very much it's very much like any programming language, right? You're basically sending these messages, uh, kind of like what I re referred to uh, in your off lecture. I'm doing the triple equals, like this is an operator on this and takes in this as an argument. If I switch them, in this particular case, would make no difference since they're both objects. Whereas like in the auth lecture, it, it mattered because one was a bcrypt object and one was a string object. That make sense? I'm just curious, like, like where you did like string one. Oh, OK. Double equals to one. String one. Uh, is that getting printed into a number, or is that getting printed into a string? Um, there is something in JavaScript called coercion. And that is what this loose operator will do is it will attempt to coerce whatever object type this is into whatever the same object type is here, and then see if they're equal. 
which is weird. I don't want to get too much into coercion because then you get weird things like array is equal to zero and stuff. And you're like, oh. So, cool. Is that fair? All right. Any other questions? It's a good class. Smart class. Yeah. All right, cool. So objects, right? We talked about like the curly brackets, which I will now refer to as like the curly boys. Does anyone have, like, you guys cool with that? If I say curly boys? It's a really bad habit I've gotten into, and I think it's hilarious. Um, if you have an issue with it, please just see me offline. I'll, like, I'll change it. No big deal. Um, so for the rest of the class, I won't use it. Uh, but if I get no messages, then I will use it for the next lecture. I just want to be inclusive, you know? I'm an affable guy. I'm affable. All right. Some of you watch, uh, some of you watch <laughs> Curb Your Enthusiasm. All right, cool. So objects, right? Objects are not just the curly brackets, but they're also arrays. Notice that if you were to go through here, you don't see array. Cool. What else are objects, which are really interesting, are functions. Functions are objects. So this one's a little dicey. All right. There's something called the definition versus invocation. So if I were to take this function, boop, boop, boop. Let's put this out. Cool, all right. A function, it's just called I like pancakes. It takes in zero arguments. And then I have this bracket notation that indicates that, hey, this is where the code block is for this function. And I put a console log that says, pancake technology is truly incredible. What a time to be alive. Cool. So in Ruby, if I wanted to simply run this function, I would just put I like pancakes, just like this. And it would run. However, in JavaScript, if I were to simply pass in the name of it, I'm asking for a reference to the function. So I will be getting the definition of the function. If I wanted to execute the function, I have to put in the bananas, the parentheses. I say a lot of weird things. You'll get used to me. Cool? So this, however, no, um, Chrome added this new thing where it doesn't like to, cons it's just not, it's not friendly. Uh, cool. Which brings me to my next point. You'll have to return everything. Cool. So if I like pancakes, it's the reference to the function. I like pancakes invoked. It will simply return. Pancake technology is truly incredible. What a time to be alive. Cool. So this is very important. Who feels comfortable with this difference between invoking the function with the parentheses and without? Feel comfortable with this? Only parentheses? What do you mean? Just like this? Um, not exactly. So if I just put the parentheses, um, I'm literally saying that I'm opening a parentheses. I'm putting nothing in it, and I'm closing a parentheses. This best way I can describe it is like this console will execute your code. And so if I'm just putting the parentheses, it will try to attempt to execute essentially nothing. So it doesn't really know what it is. Very good question. Uh, we will get to that this afternoon. Like it's like worth like 30, 45 minutes. All right, cool. Great. So reference versus invocation, super important. Ja, are you there, Ja? It's me, Ross Trent. All right. So functions are objects, right? That means that if I were to do something like I like pancakes. I have a reference to a function, but because this is just an object, I can add properties to it like any other object. Like if I wanted to put dot your boy equals to Wangtron, I can do I like pancakes. It's just, again, a reference to a function. If I wanted to refer to the, pro the properties or attributes, I can put your boy, and I will actually see it. If I want to see all of the properties on something, I can console them and I will see all the properties. If I open this up, I could see a property called your boy. I could see the name of it and then a couple of other like really cool things. 
which we'll get to later. Cool. So console dir allows you to see all the properties of an object. Very important. There's a lot of other things that console has. You can do, like, if you were to console log, you were to get, yep, yerp. Oh, damn. It doesn't like that. Chrome. It's worn. Yeah, it's new. It doesn't. <sighs> Alert still works, yeah, but it's supposed to show you, like, a warning. It's all right. Don't worry. It's going to be okay. Yeah, it depends on your version of, of Chrome. I upgraded because I like did a presentation on like the uh, the dev tools. And like an idiot, I was like, oh, you know what's a really good idea? To completely mess with the version before a big presentation. Um, so I done goofed. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so cool. Yeah, 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 ja, 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 um, I don't really want to get into expression declaration. I don't want to get into this. All right, so we talked about type checking. All right, so I want to talk about this before I kind of like end this and let you go. Is doing labs are different from mod two, right? Do you heard in mod two it was like, hey, go ahead and like if it works in the browser, you're good to go. Go ahead and skip, pass go, collect two hundred dollars and just move on, right? So in mod three, um, we're not going to do that. Mod three, I need you to actually pass all the labs um, within reason, right? Like if you're like pairing with a partner, I don't need you to go back, copy and paste the code so you can pass the labs. But the idea here is that uh, when you were in mod one, you were introduced something, God bless you, to something called TDD, right? Test Driven Development. And that is like each individual method you can test. If you have a certain input, it should always return a specific output, right? Same thing when it comes to mod three, because mod one and mod three are the, the foundations. It's a language, right? So you should understand how the language is working versus something in like mod two where you're doing something called BDD which is behavior driven development. And that is like, I wanna click this link and this thing should pop up. I wanna hit this button, these params should come through. The way to test that is very, very, very specific, right? Through the Capybara testing framework. And the idea is that I, we didn't want you to memorize or learn what Capybara is looking for because the idea is like, do you know how it works and can you make it work? Rather than can you make Capybara read your code and prove that it works, which is not as important. Here in mod three, you're just doing the fundamentals of the language again. So if it's like, I need a function that returns an array that looks like this, then you need to be able to make a function that returns an array that looks like this. It's very useful, very practical, and extremely common on like whiteboard coding interviews. And so when it comes to like just the testing in mod three, it's a lot better. Obviously there are times where it's like, not perfect, um, but Dana, Ian, Gabby, and myself will be around to help you with that. Cool? Are there any questions on like the idea, the philosophy behind like the labs, the testing, and getting through them? Okay. All right. So the next thing is like proper indentation and styling is really important. So if you were in mod one or mod two and you kind of got away with like not indenting your code whatsoever, um, <laughs> you're going to have a hard time debugging, right? The idea is that JavaScript is written a very specific way, and it's very unforgiving. Who here in mod one forgot a lot of their end statements? Right? It was like, oh, unexpected end, like, oops. You guys did that? Yeah. I, I still do it. All right? So if you haven't, congratulations. Um, so the idea is that JavaScript doesn't have like this def end. It's just these curly brackets. And you will be writing functions inside functions inside functions that invoke other functions. And so if you miss one curly bracket, you're in no, it's like lovingly known as like JavaScript hell. Uh, so if you don't have your indentations done properly, it will be extremely difficult to debug your code. So for example, right, even in HTML, let's take a look here. Um, boop, 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 right? You can have a bunch of divs. Uh, let's do this. Boop, 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 right? Word. And let's just make a bunch of these. Cool. If I wanted to, right, add a div that wraps this whole thing, like a div here, take all this and move it inside. Notice how this div wraps all of these divs. Yes? Yeah? Eat? Cool. If I want to do that again, as you've probably noticed, 
CSS enjoys this very much. So far, this one div wraps this one div that wraps these five divs. You can see it clearly because of the indentation. Right? If you do not indent your code, and I simply asked you, cool, and I did this, and then I did this, and I'd be like, great. Where do your divs open and end? Who would be able to very quickly, very readily determine that? Definitely not me. And so the idea here is that if you indent your code, it will become so much easier, not only just to visualize, it would be like visually appealing, uh, but it also become much easier and better to debug. Cool? Speaking of debugging, I'm just going to introduce a couple things. Um, when we talked about uh, like going through your code, in Ruby, when you debug your code, what did you use? Use like pry, use bybug, and use a lot of puts statements, right? I put a puts here to kind of see what came out. Some of you didn't do that, and that's okay because you got used to this pry. You got used to the bybug, all right? So puts and console log are going to be your equivalent here in terms of your debugging, and then you can have debugger. If you literally write debugger, I, I put in the semicolons, that's fine. If you don't, it will pause your code exactly the same way as your bybug. Cool, so please get used to this tool and use it a lot when you're writing your code. If something is gonna execute and it hits the debugger, it will pause that code. All right, so for example, if I were to refresh, you will see, okay, I'm not on the right website. Uh, let me hit save, oop, oop. Exit out of here and open index.html. So nothing happens, right? It doesn't pause at all. If I open the Chrome DevTools and I refresh, it will hit the debugger. Without the DevTools open, the debugger will not proc. Cool. And then here, you can just use console, or you can use the console on the bottom and just be like Word and whatever you want. If you wanted to get fancy with your put statements, console log, you can put this percent %c followed by a CSS attribute. And that will help you determine like where you are in your code. So I have green, gold, and fire brick, which is like a lot of cool colors Chrome comes with. And this is what it comes out to. Yeah? Yeah, sure. Let's just say, of course, of course. Let's just say I was console logging a bunch of stuff, right? And instead of fire brick, I was like, let's use goldenrod, which is also a pretty cool color. Right, whatever, no big deal. And there was like a typo there, right? Let's just say I console lag. <laughs> I guess some of you didn't like that, it's okay. If I refresh, I will be in the debugger, right? And I can just simply like go over. Like, what is console? Oh my god, console is like this amazing object that has all of these methods attached to it. So console, console log is a function, it's real. And then I can ask, what is the return value of this? I can highlight it, it says undefined, which is fine because console log just like puts will return like this undefined. But if I were to go to console here, I see that I've typed it, I can highlight it, I see that I've typed it properly. So what is console.lag? It'll be like undefined. Oh my god, I have like a typo here. I can pause the code in the middle of it and you'll see green and gold executed. But because I'm in the debugger, did goldenrod execute? It should not have, no. That's not actually goldenrod, that's yellow. That's gold, but either way. So the idea here is like, it'll just pause your code in the middle of it, um, and you can kind of like just highlight over things. So let's use another example, right? If I had a function, you guys wanna like help me out here? Like any function? One, all right. Two Zs, right? <laughs> One plus one. So in JavaScript, we'll be using this uh, camel case versus the Ruby, which is more like the snake case. Cool. Yeah, it'll read it. But uh, if you are writing JavaScript, you should be writing in this camel case. Because if, if not, people will be like, oh, how long have you been writing JavaScript? And you're like two years. You're like, where are you, though? Uh, no, this is just the convention of the language. It'll still read perfectly fine. So boop boop, I can have this, uh, I don't know, let's do one plus, 
three, sure, return, right? And then I have to invoke it. Because right? if I don't invoke it, what happens? Nothing will happen, right? Like if I were to save this and I were to refresh, all of a sudden in the console, like nothing will be there. Cool? Because I'm not doing anything. I can use these. This is called step, which is like buy bugs next, right? You have a what? OK. Um, thank you. So if I hit like step, it'll just go to the next line. It'll execute the next line. Cool? And all of a sudden, like I get all these like weird errors. All right. Console lag is not a function. Wow, very good. We'll just get rid of that. Oop. Cool. So I'm in the buy bug again. If I were to hit this, this is just run until you hit the next debugger. So if I can hit it, there's no debugger. It's just continually executing my code. In my console, nothing is really there. But I have access to something called 1 plus 1. So what is 1 plus 1? It's a function. If I invoke it, I see 1, 3. Cool? That's not what I really want, though. You know what I mean? And so with the debugger, if I was trapped in there, I can kind of see what's going on here. Is that, is that helpful to you? You just got to pause your code wherever you think makes sense. This is a very important time to create process. All right, are there any questions on just sort of like this intro to JavaScript, the seven data types, pass by reference versus pass by value? All right, arrays are objects, objects are objects, and functions are objects. Cool? Running my JavaScript? Yeah. Cool. I will answer that question and then we will we'll break. Cool. So the idea here is that uh, your JavaScript is just this index.js file. When I open my index.html, notice here I'm just importing my JavaScript. So the HTML will take the JavaScript file that I have and execute it and run it. So when I open index.html, which is what I did here, it's opening this HTML specifically that has access to this JS file. So when I'm in Chrome and I'm in like this exact file, index.html, it'll be running that index.js file. Does that work? Good question. All right. If nothing else, that's all I have for you today.